Hello, hello, everybody. So we are back today for another career and spirituality conversations. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Julie Pohn, and I support spiritual seekers having a career experience to reconcile what they do for a living with who they are as a soul. And in that mission today, I am receiving uh, Richard Spitzer. Hi, Richard. How are you today? Oh, great. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, so I'm excited about this conversation. We met uh, recently uh, on one of um, uh, my Zoom meditations, so that was a, a great conversation we had then. And I'm um, I'm curious to uh, to know about uh, your journey and to know a little bit more about your books and the course that you've put together about positivity. But before we start around that, um, as usual, we'll have a very short grounding for about two minutes. So let's start by just closing our eyes. And for everyone listening, only do that if you're not in, in a moving vehicle, obviously. And uh, first, let's just press our feet on the ground for a few moments connecting with the earth, grounding ourselves, and then bringing our attention all the way back up into the area of the chest, connecting with the heart. Maybe we can feel our heart, or hear our hearts. And then just taking a few deep, slow breaths, a little bit deeper and slower than usual. And doing so, imagining as if our breath is flowing in and out directly from our hearts. And I'll keep the time for us for about a minute. And I let us know when we are ready for the next part. And let's take just one more. And amazing. Let's bring ourselves back into the here and now. When we are ready, opening the eyes and welcome back. Yes. Hello. Good to be here again. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, uh, Richard, so um, uh, to introduce you briefly, uh, so I know that you've been working for over 50 years as a business executive and you're now retired. You've been working uh, in communication and behavioral research during your career. And as and once retired, as you were experiencing some challenges, you were a little bit frustrated with what was already out there out there in terms of solution and especially around uh, being more positive. So you took the matter into your own hands and applied your business expertise, your consulting expertise to the topic. And out of that is born, actually born four books and a course around positivity, positivity intelligence and lots of um, elements around that that you'll talk about better than i could so i'm going to um, uh, i'm going to leave it with you to explain to us all of that uh, but as usual you know like in this conversation i always like to start with uh, an understanding of your spiritual journey or your 
perspective, your uh, basically what spirituality means to you. Okay, well, um, you covered some of the, you know, the main points, but uh, yeah, my background you know, was in various types of business information, communications, marketing, research. Uh, that wasn't where I started. I was going to be a biologist, but uh, then I found out I wasn't very good at chemistry, but I was better with an analysis and information. And then I, got, I switched into that uh, when I was still in college. Yeah. And I got fascinated by marketing and advertising. I was interested in uh, information, information used to understand why people do what they do, how you change their attitudes, uh, mm -hmm. how you identify trends and apply them to the future. And I just got all caught up in, I love information. Mm -hmm. So I spent my life in research, um, worked for big companies, you know, corporations, then I went into the consulting side, and uh, in my last job, where it was for 15 years, mm -hmm. it was a marketing research consulting firm. Um, I was in charge of all research and product development, and we became a global company, and um, uh, I was pretty successful. I retired at 55 mm -hmm. uh, because I was getting too busy, too much travel, and I decided I'm young enough to have a new career. Mm -hmm. uh, had a lot of ideas. But I also found out that, gee, I just left 35, almost 40 years of work with resources, people, uh, computer departments, and now I'm on my own. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I failed to make that uh, on my list of things to do, you know, have $10 million in an IT department. <laughs> so uh, over the next few years, uh, I worked with several you know, small groups, businesses to develop uh, research-based systems for human resources, for medical patient compliance, but it all centered on one thing, which was why do people think what they think? How do they make decisions? How do you influence? But also how do you learn what they need? Because my basic interest is um, how do things work and how can you make them better if you can? Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's what I like to do, uh, to my wife's frustration sometimes, like leave it alone. <laughs> it's fine. Okay. Um, okay. but at the if same time, as you... if it ain't broken, don't fix it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> many. Uh, and as you mentioned, I got frustrated. Uh, yeah. it's like, you know, I went through my business career achieving a lot, but always with a lot of angst, you know, worry, frustration, uh, how are things going to turn out? Therapists call mm -hmm. it catastrophizing. So mm -hmm. I worked harder. I worked smarter, as they say. But I always saw a few people who seemed to make it look easier. Mm -hmm. Well, as I later learned, you know, they had their own issues. But they also had other personality and philosophical skill sets. Yeah, they might border on spirituality, mm -hmm. but I didn't realize it at the time. So a few years after I retired, I went to see a therapist. And he said, well, okay, I understand this. And uh, he, he said, read a book uh, by Dr. Wayne Dyer. You may know him. He's called Manifest Your Destiny. Mm -hmm. And I look at it, still have it. You know, it's all yellow. All the pages are highlighted. I said, well, I understand some of this. I said, I understand the philosophical. I didn't understand the metaphysical, mm -hmm. which is, you know, the border you know, between, you know, the real world and the spiritual world. Mm -hmm. And so I, I got into that. I said, well, I understand this. I'm, I'm going to investigate and see how I can help myself. Mm -hmm. So I read a lot of his books. I one of his books is, you know, there's a spiritual solution to every problem. Um, but uh, so, you know, in between reading, oh, maybe I probably read and tried things for 10 years or more. Mm -hmm. I kept notes because that's what I do. And a lot of good information, but ultimately frustrating and it all came down to, through all that I've read, whether it's going back to the Stoic philosophers, uh, the, the, you know, the Indian and the Chinese philosopher who was Confucius, uh, through Shakespeare to Tony Robbins and Wayne Dyer and Jack Canfield and hundreds of other people, you know, uh, one of the singular messages that applied to me was you have to have a positive attitude. You have mm -hmm. to have optimism. You have to have a belief. Um, 
you know Henry Ford, the you know Ford automaker, he mm-hmm. summed up 3,000 years of history in one quote. He said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Um, well, that struck a chord. So I got involved in, uh, first was called the Law of Attraction. Okay, that mm-hmm. had its heyday many years ago. And I read about uh, many of the authors from the American New Thought movement in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And then I moved into manifestation. That seemed more real. Uh, And then uh, I decided I'm going to write about it because I remembered an incident that happened in 1971. Uh, I was working at Quaker Oats, uh, you know, cereal company. And there was a cereal called Captain Crunch. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It, it, And I was eating. Yeah. 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 Uh, So big cereal in the United States. And I was critiquing an ad for mm-hmm. kids. And my boss said, Rich, you have to be more positive about this. And I said, I'm just being trying to be helpful that I don't think you should have this commercial with guns in there. You know, <laughs> so you've you got to be more positive, Rich. It's just just for kids. You know, it's not real guns. Yeah, yeah. So, OK, I heard the words. You have to be more positive. But I didn't know what that meant in my case. Well, mm-hmm. six months later, the commercials came out without the guns. Other mm-hmm. people saw it and they had a broom instead. The, the pirates chasing Captain Crunch with a broom instead of a gun. Okay. But I realized over my life, you know, people perceive you differently than you think about yourself. Yeah. And where I might uh, be anxious or concerned, people could say, well, you're being negative. So fast forward, you know, 50 years. So uh, as I saw in my reading and even some therapists, you know, we'll try to be more optimistic, try to have a more positive outlook. Uh, you have to be positive most of the time. So I focused on that one issue, you know, positive thinking. And then I discovered something uh, that I was surprised, which was if I say you have to be more positive or be positive most of the time, great. But there is no measure of that. Mm-hmm. How do I know what is more? Mm-hmm. How will I know when I've become more? Yeah. What is the threshold where more becomes effective? Yeah. It's like... There's virtually nothing on that. There's some minor uh, academic research where there's ratios that if you have four negative thoughts, it has to be every negative thought has to be offset by three or four positive thoughts. Mm -hmm. So there's some, you know, uh, incidental research on that, but nothing formal. So I decided positivity or positive thinking will be my focus. Mm -hmm. And then I became even more specific. It's not, not just positive thinking, you know, positive thought is fleeting. Oh, that's a beautiful house. I love that. I wish I could have it. But when I would be walking in with my wife down by the lake and I see the house, I say, it's a beautiful house. You know, if I hadn't made that decision or if I had bought that stock, I could be living here instead of not living there. So my thoughts became a string of self-talk, which really is the essence of our negativity. You know, the negative stories we tell ourselves. And I said, aha, this is... The, the real the concept so i did write my first book the manifestation for, uh, formula which was more metaphysical mm-hmm. it has more of the spirituality mm-hmm. uh because i was interested but mm-hmm. in the process i was practicing what i was preaching and i ran some meetup groups uh, if you're familiar with the platform yeah. and people yeah. said it's interesting but you know how will it help me so i wrote a second book uh, modern positivity uh, being like here's more of the mechanics yeah. And ran some more meetup groups after I published it with a workbook. Um, and both of them still had the the core thing, which is your your positivity thought scorecard, how you keep track of your thinking. And people said, yeah, that's great, too. But just tell me, you know, what do I have to do? So then I wrote the third book, mm-hmm. Positivity Intelligence, because that brought it all together. Yeah. Because as I, I looked at the the evolution of intelligence, you know, the standard IQ test, like your IQ is 100, 120. That goes back to the late 1890s where some British mathematicians said, we can observe uh, quality thinking and success. Is there a way to measure it besides touching the bumps on a person's head? So they they, they developed, uh, you know, the first standardized yeah. measurements, which was with us for 100 years. Um, then in the uh, 1990s, a Harvard psychologist, Harvard Gardner said, you know, there's all kinds of success. Mm -hmm. There's physical success, like an athlete. There's interpersonal, like leaders and politicians. 
there's mathematical and logical. You don't just have a high IQ. Mm -hmm. So he says there's, you know, multiple intelligences. He wrote a book. Yeah. And then also at the same time came out the acceptance of emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. how you understand and deal with your own feelings and relationships. Then uh, Martin Seeley from the University of Pennsylvania said, well, there's positive psychology, mm -hmm. focusing on what we can do better and our strengths, not just focusing on the abnormalities. Yeah. So there's this evolution of understanding how we think, how we behave, what are the catalysts. And I said, but there's one common thread to all of it, you know, it's all having a positive belief system. Mm -hmm. um, but as some management gurus many years ago said, you can't change what you can't measure. And I mm -hmm. said, that's what's missing for me. Yeah. Rich, be more positive. Wayne Dyer said, be more optimistic. Mm -hmm. Martin Seligman said, focus, do thought record sheets, keep track of your positive, negative thoughts. But to me, it's like, well, when will I be positive enough? Yeah. Because... Uh, if you look at the statistics for all the health and wellness programs, whether it's nutrition, weight loss, or people starting a business or writing a book, uh, you aren't making the progress you expect. You give up too soon mm -hmm. uh, because your psychological beliefs are not aligned with the regimen you're going through. So I said, there must be a way to measure yeah. how well my positive beliefs are synchronized with my physical activities to achieve my goal. Mm -hmm. So I said, that's what I'm going to focus on. And I calling it basically cognitive positive intelligence, how well you're aware of and are able to measure and manage your thoughts and your self-talk as applied to a goal, not just to be a happy person, which is fine, but me, mm -hmm. I was focused on achieving a goal. Okay. You know, in which case it was, I want to write books. Well, I did it. Yeah. Now I have to make him a bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I love that. So let me track back a little bit. I got a few questions in my head already. So, uh, so in my understanding, so you you started to be interested in spirituality after um, after noticing that some of your colleagues had a little uh, how do you say. Uh, had that little advantage maybe in being less anxious and those ones had that connection to spirituality but does it mean that did, did you not did you, did you have no um, maybe no in your upbringing or the early stages of your of your life that where there are no uh, spiritual you know or even religious um, beliefs in your in your life uh, I've always had very strong philosophical beliefs yeah Okay. Not so much uh, formal religious beliefs. Okay. You know, okay. I was, you know, reading all the, the philosophers, you know, in, you know, mm -hmm. grammar school and high school. I mean, I, I love the, 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 the complex thinking, you know, trying to figure out what they meant. Yeah. So I always had one foot in that. Okay. Um, and when I read Wayne Dyer's book and he was more, you know, directly spiritual, mm -hmm. um, I said, well, I understand and believe part of that. But, you know, I still need to understand what it is, how it works, how can I utilize it or benefit from it? Mm -hmm. Basically, I couldn't take things strictly on faith. Yes. I needed to understand. Mm -hmm. And even as I read in my current book, it got into just the use of words. So the words of spirit, spirituality, um, and they apply to, you know, your interest in what I did. I've seen spiritual used in two overlapping ways. Mm -hmm. I was recently reading a book. Uh, name is Richard Dots. He's written a lot of books about uh, manifestation. Mm -hmm. And he and others have said, everything that there is exists in one of two places, the real physical world or the spiritual world, the spiritual plane. Mm -hmm. You know, as the quantum people say, the field of potentialities. So it's either real and physical, you've manifested, or it's unmanifested, it's in the spiritual world. It's, it's imagined but not realized yet. Mm -hmm. So that's saying... I can see it or I can imagine it. So there's some other external greater something out there. Then there's spirituality, which is, you know, a belief mm -hmm. capability of philosophy. And in my current book, I said, you know, what are all the lessons I had to learn to achieve positivity? Mm -hmm. And what have I read? You know, there's books on patience, there's books on resilience, there's books on gratitude. And I collected, you know, hundreds of words uh, and I broke them down into six 
basically lesson plans. Mm -hmm. And one of them is you have to know yourself. And this is where s spirituality fits that you need a belief capability. Mm -hmm. um, in the Did research you, I've done. So can you define like belief capability? Yes. I mean, it's that you're willing to acknowledge that there is some uh, something inside of you and something yeah. outside of you that okay. can be connected, okay. that can work together to achieve mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. And you have to believe that you don't have to understand everything. Mm -hmm. uh, in work I've done with psychologists, as a matter of fact, a number of years ago, I worked with some psychiatrists on uh, developing a patient compliance assessment system. Why, is, why are some people really good patients? They follow instructions and some never do. Mm -hmm. And we got into a psychological segmentation analysis. And there are some people who don't believe anything. They don't believe in themselves. They don't believe in any doctors. They don't believe in any religious order. I mean, everything is, whatever the reasons, you know, there is no ability to believe in anything. Mm -hmm. So I had a belief capability mm -hmm but I didn't have a focus for it. Mm. And part of it was I needed to understand something about why this might work. And mm -hmm. that's what led me to this positivity intelligence, something we all have, but it's neglected. We're not really taught it. Mm -hmm. And once I came up with a way to, as I said, that quote before, how can I define it and measure it? So I used my background to say, I'm going to build on what people have discovered. Mm -hmm. I'm going to add my own twist to it from, I mean, over, you know, 40 years in research, I, I calculated, you know, I've been involved in, you know, thousands of research studies, mm -hmm. all trying to figure out how people think, how they decide. Uh, uh, we had to manage a large research system. So I've done a lot of research on research. So I realized I've been looking at this for, you know, decades, done a lot mm -hmm. of personal interviews and focus groups. And there's a big difference between what you say to a person one on one and hear back versus when you see a quantified report, there's a lot lost in the translation. Mm -hmm. So I said, if I can measure my self-talk to give me a goal, mm -hmm. then maybe I could improve my level of positive thinking because mm -hmm. right now, uh, I don't know if I'm positive enough. Yeah. And I forgot the exact words from Thomas Edison, but basically many people have said, uh, most people give up too soon. Mm -hmm. There's one step short of success. Yeah. I think some football coach said winners are just losers who tried one more time. And, uh, and I said, you know, I'm going to keep trying until I figure this out. Mm -hmm. So the spirituality was, as you're saying, the, the ability that can I find something that I'm comfortable with mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm looking for something, but I want to understand it. And, uh, uh, I, you know, for myself, I did it. And I think well, if I do it, there's millions of other people who are buying every book in the world out there. Yeah. Um, you know, listen to some of your past uh, interviews and there was somebody, I don't remember her name, but she talked about, what was it? Think, feel, do. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was episode 40. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's like, yes, we all think. That's the only thing over which we have control. Yeah. And we feel that our thoughts influence our emotions. And then we make decisions. Mm -hmm. Another one of your guests, you know, and you've talked about so intuition. Mm -hmm. I realized I had strong intuition that I often neglected because I was too logical and rational. My mm -hmm. big, some of my biggest successes were, you know, I acted on tuition. Mm -hmm. I was prepared because I could give an answer, but I wasn't prepared for the moment. But uh, situations yeah, you, where. Sorry, say that again. You were not prepared for. I mean, I was in situations where I had the knowledge and the skills yeah, yeah. to react, mm -hmm. but I didn't know that situation was coming up. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. So like one day, many years ago, I went to see the CEO of the company. He called me in uh, the same day I was supposed to see my boss, uh, but I didn't see him because the CEO called and said, well, so-and-so, he's been fired. So here's what I want you to do. <laughs> and in that moment, I said, no. I'm not going to do that. Here's what I would like to do. Here's how I can help. So I didn't know that moment was going to occur, mm -hmm. but I, but I had the knowledge in the background to, for some reason, intuition, some feeling, some inspiration, some unknown spiritual nudge. Yeah. This is what I'm supposed to say right now. Okay. And that led me to becoming a partner in a company 
we eventually went from 35 million to 500 million dollars. Uh, we went public. We bought companies all over the world, and that's when I retired. But yeah. uh, so there are moments where that spiritual nudge, the instinct uh, that I had often ignored, mm -hmm. sometimes the urge was so strong I couldn't ignore it. Okay. So okay. these are the lessons I've had to learn to get to the point where I am today, which is, can you write a book in a program? Mm -hmm. uh, can it be done? Or someone said, well, how do you know your program works? Well, because we're talking. Because I said, I'm going to write this book. I'm going to construct the whole program. Someone's working on the app. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a fairly ambitious thing. And most people would give up. Yeah. Uh, that's just the nature of things. So it worked for me. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because you sound to me like a, uh, you went at spiritual concept, like or, or uh, subtle concepts with all of the um, the analytical power of the of the thinking and the deconstructing um, subjects uh, that are not easy um, that that are not so tangible. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things, you know, a lot of people interested are interested in or say they are like in quantum science, quantum mm -hmm. physics. Yeah, it's fascinating. I understand, you know, 1%. But the goal is to find what's the most fundamental, irreducible uh, element or particle. Mm -hmm. And they say it's some unknown type of energy that has information that mm -hmm. when different things are combined, you have new kinds of information. So you just use the word, yeah, I deconstructed everything I learned from reading, from thousands of studies, from talking with therapists. Mm -hmm. Like to me, the most fundamental issue that under overrides everything is positivity, which is not just positive thoughts. It's adaptability, resilience, creativity, perseverance, persistence, patience, a belief, hope, faith, all mm -hmm. these things work together in different amounts at different times. Mm -hmm. And in the book I've just written, you know, there's a little bit on the, the positivity scorecard. But yeah. when people said, well, how does it work? What do I do? Where do I start? They said, here are the 36 lessons I had to learn mm -hmm. in different degrees at different times. I still have to learn patience every day. Okay. But I'm pretty adaptable. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've learned that lesson long ago. Patience, I'll never learn. Uh, oh, you know the way we say like language is important as well. You know, like yes. uh, so, and you yeah. know, like as you said it, and Ford said whether you believe you can or you can't, you're right. So when yeah. you say, "Oh, patience, I will never learn," yeah. <laughs> and, you know, part of it too is yeah. a lot of what I read seemed to su suggest you got to be positive, like yeah. all or nothing, mm -hmm. and you know that's just not true. It's not possible. You know, our, our our basic survival mechanism is to have a productive level of fear, caution, you know, don't walk into that dark cave. There might be a little dinosaur there. Yeah. Um, but a lot of what I read left off me thinking, well, you got to be positive. So mm -hmm. I said, you know, I came up with my own statistical measure of what is the threshold of positivity, which is basically the bell-shaped curve. Yeah. That if you want to be, the positivity IQ is basically... 68% mm -hmm. of your thoughts are sustained about what you're trying to achieve, then you have a level of positive thinking that probably will not be overwhelmed by all the inevitable negatives and obstacles. Mm -hmm. And the bell-shaped curve, you know, has been around for 250 years. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the essence of uh, most of what we understand about quantum theory, the natural probability distributions of things. You know, there's another concept Mm -hmm. I came across more recently. It's called psychological entropy. Uh, Ooh, entropy is a you know, term from physics and science mm -hmm. about things go from a state of order to disorder. Mm -hmm. Carl Jung was big on that. Um, it's been picked up by other people more recently. Um, and I saw that is true with our psychology that, you know, uh, people who have a high state of entropy, chaos disorder, uh, the whole role of cognitive therapy is to try and bring more order to it. Mm -hmm. But there's still no measure of what the effective level is. And what I have found from working with people to participate in research, I need 
some measure, am I making progress? Mm -hmm. If you can't give me a number, if you can't make it a game, if you can't give me a report card, it's harder for me to stay motivated and disciplined. Yeah. Now we all go through school and we get report cards. Yeah. That's our measure. That's supposed not that it motivates us, but we have a measure. But it has not been applied to this whole concept of being more positive. So mm -hmm. I've I've made a start on measuring what it means to have a level of effective positivity. Mm -hmm. And what what happens in life when we reach that um, that level when we are when we are finally like you said at the start, positive enough. Like, wh why would we want to be that positive? I mean, what does it bring us? Well, that, that's a good question. From my own experience in talking with people, if you're not positive enough, um, every little challenge, every little absolute, you could say, ah, I did it again. I messed up again. Nothing ever works out for me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to quit. Uh, that becomes that's an easy, normal way of life. Yeah. When you reach, I think, an effective level of positivity, then sure you have it and you say, okay, I'll figure out another way. Well, mm -hmm. I knew it was going to happen. I didn't know it was going to happen today. Mm -hmm. And three weeks from now, this will all be in the past. I've given this one of my, I have three daughters yeah. and she, one of them keeps reminding me, well, dad, you said that if I change my attitude six months from now, this will all be solved. It'll be in the past. And she says, you know, you're right. Six months from now, this will just be history. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, what, what I think many people have said, uh, yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, all you have is now. Yeah. You know, and of course, all the books written about now. So yes, the future is built on stringing all these nows together. But it's being able to meet it knowing that you have the ability, spiritual or a positivity IQ, that yeah. it's inevitable there's going to be challenges. You have to learn things. And that's what I've observed in successful people. They keep going. If you lined up all the people who win Oscars, Olympic medals, any award, what they say? Well, my mother, my father, my coach, my teacher, my mentor, Julie said, you know, I just have to keep working and persist and believe I can do it. And I will. Yeah. This is a universal acknowledgement of what it takes to be successful. Mm. Uh, you have to persevere. You have to persist. Um, and we don't necessarily learn how because we don't have either by nature or by nurture or by some other instruction, we don't necessarily learn how to uh, train ourselves to develop a positivity habit. Yeah. Because my goal is not to say you're positive, it's to increase your probability of success mm -hmm. uh, instead of, you know, guarantee your failure. Mm -hmm. See, as you're talking, I'm getting that clearer image about uh, why should we be positive, what the benefits of positivity as if it's um, uh, it's what keeps us, actually what we can control to keep in check our natural instinct for somehow stagnation, like, you know, that safe zone. So right. like that positive, uh, like you said earlier, uh, finding each little challenges a reason to uh, to go beyond it or for it not to stop us basically so it's that key that keeps us moving forward when everything even our natural instinct would tell us to retract and stay safe and um and stay in comfort in in yeah in right. the security yeah. of our comfort zone right exactly exactly i mean you know it's well known that humans have a negativity bias. Mm -hmm. This yeah. is our survival mechanism. There were psychologists and mathematicians, I think Kahneman and Tversky many years ago at Stanford wrote a book on, I think it's called prospect theory, mm -hmm. that we give over, we overweight the negatives and underweight the positives. I mean, one of the simple examples is if I win a thousand dollars, I'm happy. If I lose a thousand dollars, I'm devastated. Yeah. You know? So we tend to have far more intense negative reactions to certain kinds of consequences. But that yeah. happens in every challenge we face. And mm -hmm. that's why I learned the word catastrophizing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I had to learn to overcome that, that things mm -hmm. are going to happen. I am now prepared because I know, but also once you have a little success, 
you can build on that. And once you have a string of success, you just say, you know, I've built that positivity habit mm -hmm. that you, if your initial response is cautious, negative, fearful, how can you shorten that reaction to, okay, now I got to fix it. Yeah. So actually it brings me back to, because the example that you gave at the start actually stayed with me. You know, like when you said that you were working for the serial company and you had, you were basically somehow like warning of some stuff about the this ad. And the response that you got was, oh, you just got to be more positive. But here, isn't it like, a, where is the fine line between um, being positive and in that sense, maybe in the sense that the person who was telling you to be positive at the time, uh, was it just to be more like, do you just need to be more cheerful and supportive? Right. But, <laughs> but, but I, what I see is that it's, uh, would just being positive in that sense override like the benefits of uh basically a thoughtful risk analysis yeah yeah i mean that's it you know, when i was told to be more positive they meant being go along with everybody be cheerful don't make any waves yeah. um, but that's not what know. what's true positivity is about i mean from yeah. From, yeah. from your book, it's it's a it's an attitude to move forward, but it doesn't mean to skip <clears throat> being attentive to, you know, in that case to detail. It sounded to me like more you were being that was attention to detail and um, and uh, being rigorous and in your in your work, right? Well, I thought I was. Of course, yeah. you can go overboard being too detail oriented. I mean, if you're if you're if you're just totally. Uh, uncontrolled positive, they call that toxic positivity, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. you are you're blind to option opportunities and you're blind to risks. And you just can't be happy and cheerful all the time because that's a different kind of substitution issue. Uh, yeah. You have to be able to recognize, and that's one of my chapters, recognition of opportunities and risks, adaptability, that things are going to change, adapt. Yeah. We, You and I are sitting here today because our ancestors going back several hundred thousand years ago were the people who could adapt, who were resilient, who had a sufficiently positive attitude to know that they would live to fight another day. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Viktor Frankl, you know, the you know, psychi psychiatrist and philosopher, you know, his whole book about, you know, the, the reason and finding meaning in life was all about, you have to have an optimistic look about Things will be better. Mm -hmm. And that's what he said got him through, you yeah. know, the, the concentration camps. He said mm -hmm. the people who gave up, who saw no hope. Now, he didn't have any test and controlled studies. He didn't do any surveys there. Pure observation. Yeah. And, you know, what's fascinating about all modern psychology mm -hmm. is that the whole history of the field, let's say, is 2,500 years old. The first observations. Yeah. So out of. 2,500 years, for 2,400 years, there were no tests or measurements. Mm -hmm. There were shrewd observations of human behavior. Yeah. And yes, now we want to be more rigorous and make it safe and bring it to more people. But most of what we know about human nature was observed, you know, you read Greek literature, Roman philosophers, mm -hmm. you wonder, how could they have observed exactly the same thing we see in the news every day? So we've observed it. Now, how do we learn better to manage it to benefit ourselves and society and everything else? Mm, yeah. And something else that you said, you know, um, uh, struck a chord that we are, we, there is a, a difference between how people see us and how we see ourselves. So at the time, were you seeing so it sounds like people were seeing you as not so positive, but how were you seeing yourself? Did, did you have yeah. an awareness of that, whether or not you were positive? Was it even a thought in your head? I mean, yeah, I think so. I mean, many years ago, there was a popular psychology, pop psychology uh, moment called the imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. that you're doing something, you're doing well but someday they're going to find out. And this is a pretty common thing. 
you know, mm -hmm. going back to the cereal company, yeah. when I uh, went to see the head of one of the groups, I wanted to make a change in what I was doing because I wasn't satisfied. <laughs> so um, he he turned around and showed me all these books behind him, all these big black binders. He said, Rich, the secret of my success is that I know everything about what we're doing and no better whatever question comes, I can find the answer. Mm -hmm. Well, that fit my style. I needed to know. Mm -hmm. But then people who need to know everything are always worried they don't know everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that always would drive me. But at some point, what's that phrase? Don't let the be, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. Yes. And yeah. sometimes you have to stop mm -hmm. and say, this is sufficient. I think Steve Jobs said, if you try to make it perfect, it's just a hobby. That sometimes you have to know when the product is ready to ship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, or yeah. So, I think it was him that said it, maybe it was somebody else. So, you know, that's been one of my traits. You know, when I, have you reached a sufficient level of believing your intuition, believing in yourself, believing in your goal, and say, now I'm going to publish the book yeah. instead of revising it 10 more times? But um, also, I mean, you know, you say it's like, you know, positivity applied, uh, not for the sake of being positive, but applied to achieving a goal. And, uh, but before you studied positivity, I mean, it sounds to me that you, you still had an extremely successful career. So bears, like, you know, we could argue that um, uh, it's not necessarily... It, I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate here, but that it's not is not absolutely necessary to in order to be successful, right? To be positive. Yeah, if you um, said that you didn't, you know, like you you didn't have maybe not to that level, but you know, sounds like you have like an amazing career. So right. you manage without without that tool. That, uh, yes, I think that's true. I've looked at this as one of the dilemmas. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all. Achieving your goal could be for good or bad. We've mm -hmm. had some very successful bad people. <laughs> and, but not that they were positive. Yeah. They were positive about what they believed they wanted to achieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, we, you know, a lot of philosophers talk about positive being benign or for the greater good, mm -hmm. especially going back into the new thought movie of the U.S. that this had to be aligned with God's goals. Mm -hmm. uh, so positive or success was automatically assigned to be uh, beneficial, mm -hmm. but that's not the reality. You know, many philosophers, um, people in you know our world of you know manifestation say the universe. Many of your people talked about you know being aligned with the universe, and many people have said the universe is non-judgmental, mm -hmm. right? If you give me your wishes, they're they're thorough, they're they're consistent. You know, you will, you know, you things will align and they'll work out for you. Fortunately, most people don't have, you know, terrible goals, but mm -hmm. enough do that we've had a whole history of it. So <laughs> you're right. You don't have to be positive beneficial to achieve. Mm -hmm. You just have to believe in your goal mm -hmm. and persevere. Now, it may be a bad goal, but I didn't have bad goals, you know. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at most of the people I know. Uh, people I've worked with that we want to achieve a better relationship. We want financial success. I want to be have a healthier lifestyle, but I'm not making the progress I thought. I, it's like I have a positive intention, but then what goes on in your head? Well, I guess it's not going to work this time. And that's where I developed my scorecard so mm -hmm. that you can assess yourself on a weekly basis. What am I thinking? And that was the other issue I had with a lot of the professional uh, assessment tests, mm -hmm. you do it one point in time, uh, you six months later, but we people, I want to know now, I yeah. want to know what I'm thinking now. If yeah. you're sick, you take your temperature now. You don't take it every six months. You take it three times a day. Yeah. And I try to write it in the concept of these are the words I say to myself. Here's a, a, a simplistic example. If something goes wrong, what do what uh, and you and you're going to castigate yourself? What goes on in your mind? Do you look at it? Do you have a smiley face scale in your mind? And you say, "Oh, I have a you know sad smiley face. Mm, things don't go right." Now you say to yourself, "What an idiot! Why did I do it?" 
So I try to come up with a measurement that reflects what we actually say to ourselves. We don't talk to ourselves in smiley faces. And a lot of other traditional assessments uh, use scoring that is not the way we actually think and talk to ourselves. They may be easily uh, compared across many people, but I was recognizing it. I have a simple scale, you measure it, you can compare other people on it, but this is really only about you, not how somebody else did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I was thinking about something earlier. Uh, yeah, so like, so you had, you know, you were believing, like the first part of your career, you, you had good goals. I mean, you were believing in achieving your goals and you got to it. You had a successful career. What do you think? What would have it? What sorry? What would have been different for you if you had had all the knowledge that you have now about positivity? Would you have <laughs> done things differently? What 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 could have? What 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 would have it changed? Well, I wish I knew. I've had that thought. <laughs> um, I think. The generalized answer is I look at some moments uh -huh. where if I had uh, a little more confidence mm -hmm. in what I believed, mm -hmm. I might have said to my partners, I had a business on economic forecasting for 12 years, I developed a new method of predictive analytics. And we got off onto some tangents, like predicting the stock markets. It wasn't what I started to do. Mm -hmm. But what I developed had applications. Mm -hmm. But what you just asked is exactly true. If I had more confidence at several moments, like, you know, this is what I believe we should be doing. Don't let myself be talked into this because of other people's beliefs. Mm -hmm. we're, all, we're all equal. But, you know, I founded it. Um, if I had been more um, confident mm -hmm. in what I really believed, instead of questioning myself because some other people raise questions, some things would have turned out different. At mm -hmm. the very least, and I'll look back, well, we could have done both things instead of giving up what I invented to do mm -hmm. something else. So there were several moments where mm -hmm. if I had just maybe given it one more minute, one more week, yeah. uh, one more good thought about don't make such an impulsive reaction to it, mm -hmm. go home, talk to you know my wife Andrea about it or somebody but sometimes you act instinctively the wrong way mm -hmm. and now I realize don't act immediately make sure your parachutes on tight before you jump you know <laughs> and, and, so, and and because you, with all of your knowledge because uh, I I tend to associate you know the capacity to be positive and negative or negative with our levels of stress that when our physiology gets a little too much on the fight or flight side of uh, of the scale then it becomes even more difficult to switch on the positive button and we're sort of on a, on, on on a negative loop that it becomes even difficult to to have the awareness that we're being like in the let's say in the negative Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It's it's difficult. It's so easy for us to create. Humans can create negative thoughts just mm -hmm. you know, like that. To create mm -hmm. and maintain positive is difficult. Mm -hmm. There must be some evolutionary reason for that. So mm -hmm. that's why, you know, I've learned from others, you know, you have to make your response, your positive response, a habit. Yeah. Now, and people say it takes 30 to 90 days to build a habit. Yeah. And that was another reason why I came up with this scorecard, which I think you should do weekly. Yeah. Um, because if I can measure myself weekly, it reinforces what I'm doing. If yeah. My target is, am I at 68% positivity yet? If I'm not, uh, why not? So it gives me a chance. Now, the other thing is, I don't have to wait a week. I have another sheet like, I want to take my temperature now on mm -hmm. a whim. So yeah. it's like it's almost like uh, a bad habit. Mm -hmm. for good purposes like i need a piece of chocolate to feel good so uh i do that too but what i learned why i developed the scorecard is i'm if I, am i feeling as bad as i think or am i closer to feeling good than i know so by being able to measure myself it's like you know if i'm honest about assessing where i am today 
yeah, I have some challenges, but I'm 66% positive I would give myself, then, okay, I'm doing okay. Yeah. What do I need to get a few more percentage points? But if I'm really discouraged, you know, why did I file so low? I needed that constant reinforcement, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I could not get from therapy because you can't get therapy 24 hours a day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I developed a self they call self-monitoring assessment form. Mm -hmm. I can monitor my thoughts and feelings weekly, daily, mm -hmm. on a familiar scale that was aligned with my goal. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, am I happy? Am I, how am I doing? On, am I going to work on my book today? Am I ever going to finish this? So now yeah, you could do this assessment for every goal you have, but it's not an, an all-purpose, you know, one assessment for all 10 goals. You got to do it for each one. So okay. that was my approach to what you said is that uh, uh, I had to have a mechanism that helped me build this habit. Mm -hmm. And the, once you build a habit, two things happen. You have it, but then you have to sustain it, you mm -hmm. know, because, you know, you want to, you don't want to, you know, regress to where you were before. Mm -hmm. I think that's true for all people who've had a bad habit. You yeah. have to unlearn it. And you know, not uh, be you know retrograde back to it. Mm -hmm. There's something that I'm noticing with you know because I'm also on that journey you know and trying to catch myself. Um, that you know sometimes there is that overwhelm of feeling that is below you know that is definitely uh, uh, on a low vibration, and that it feels sometimes that. You know, like uh, catching catching the thoughts. I can catch thoughts. It's like, oh, that's not very uh, positive, and reframe myself. But uh, sometimes it doesn't it, it it doesn't automatically shift the actual how I feel. So, is that sixty eight percent? Is it that tipping point that uh, if I reframe my thinking? to positive self-talk 68% of the time, then I'm getting that tipping point and then I'm feeling positive on autopilot. Is that something yeah. like that? Or? Yeah, exactly. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've had some discussions like, well, how do you know it's 68%? Yeah. Well, exactly. number one, I don't know. Okay. However, <laughs> the universe science has said there is a normal distribution if you take all of possible events and all things at random, you get the bell-shaped curve. Okay. No mm -hmm. one disputes that. Mm -hmm. Now, someone says, be more positive. And let's say you can measure me and I was positive 5% of the time. And I increased it to 10%. Mm -hmm. I'm more positive, but I'm still 90% negative. So I also go back to research I've done over, you know, hundreds of studies where, you know, you investigate people's attitudes. Why do you think that way? Why do you like it? Why do you dislike it? What would change your mind? What would change your behavior? How would you describe it? How would you play back all these things? So, you know, part skill, part art. It's like, I've learned through, I realized through all the research I've done, there's a way that people think, mm -hmm. and then they have that breakthrough, the aha moment. Mm -hmm. Um and we can all sit, we all look at people and say, well, how did my old boss uh, achieve what he did seemingly so effortlessly? But as I talked to him more over the years, not at the time I didn't realize it, but and, but I've gone back, is that he had a an innate level of optimism that he had issues, mm -hmm. all kinds of issues we all have, but yeah. he knew that this is what he wanted and he was going to make it work. Now, maybe other things didn't work in his life, but he wanted to achieve this with a business goal, mm -hmm. and he did it because mm -hmm. that's what he believed in. So yeah. he may let other things overwhelm him, yeah. but not in achieving his goal. Mm -hmm. So, And we see this with tragedy in so many celebrities mm -hmm. who have great you know, movie or entertainment careers, and then, you know, they... They kill themselves. They obviously mm -hmm. couldn't transfer their 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 drive, their perseverance, their belief in their ability to succeed as an actor or yeah. uh, some other thing, or it couldn't transfer to other aspects of their life. Yeah. I don't understand it. My my mm -hmm. range is not that dramatic, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, I'm unhappy because I didn't like my dinner last night, you know, but, you know, it's like, I'm not going to, you know, harm myself over that. Yeah. yeah. And since you've, uh, you know, now that you're monitoring yourself, uh, et cetera, like, so like you're more, you're optimistic or positive in your mindset, et cetera. And, and that drives you to write your books and achieve your goals do you do you feel do you feel internally happier like do you feel like it are you more cheerful or like you know what's the, the, does it have an impact on on how your um how you are in the world let's say mm -hmm. yeah it does you know yeah. you know i still have my grumpy days mm -hmm. but what you just described is that I have a level of internal psychic satisfaction that yeah. I had a goal, I achieved it. Um, where do I see the evidence? Well, mm -hmm. I wrote my second book, one of my granddaughters, you know, and I told yeah. her about it. She took it to school for, you know, show and tell. Yeah. You know, I'm going to show you what my grandpa wrote. Yeah. Well, to me, what a success. Yeah. You know, she didn't know anything about what I wrote, but, <laughs> you know, here's yeah. an achievement. My grandpa wrote a book. Um, so, yeah, I feel that I've accomplished it. And now, mm -hmm. if I had this conversation with somebody in a group I belong to, um, which shows the positivity habit I've developed mm -hmm. in general. He said, well, how do you know you've developed this? I said, well, Henry, if you said you needed someone to write a book for you and you asked me, could you do it in 90 days? I would say yes. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if I had any knowledge or skill, but if there was something I could do the research and write a book within my sphere of knowledge, I'm confident I can do that. Mm -hmm. No problem. Yeah. Well, would I have said that five years ago? No. Okay. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, but I have to give, this is interesting, sort of how I first wrote the first book. I was listening to, and this gets where you find the catalysts. Mm -hmm. So it was in 2016 or 2017. I was listening to a late night radio show and a woman was talking about world trends, economics, politics, conflicts, and she was really smart. And at the end of the show, uh, they introduced her uh, and she's a, she's basically an economic astrologer. Oh. I said, oh, she's an astrologer. Yeah. I mean, she doesn't tell you about your love life. She looks uh -huh. at how it applies to our world. Mm -hmm. So I felt at two o'clock in the morning compelled to send her an email saying, I really enjoyed it. I thought you worked for some fancy think tank like the Rand Corporation. Mm -hmm. No, no, that's what I've been doing for 50 years. And then the next day she said, you know, I was thinking about it. I've written several books. Uh, I was going to write another one, but I didn't want to do it by myself. You are the person I want to write the book with. And she said, let's write a book together mm -hmm. about world issues and events you know basically it turned out we had to write our own sections it was like the analyst and the astrologer mm. and she got me going yeah. i didn't know about publishing a book yeah. i uh, you know collaboration was enough of the issue so you never know when something like that's going to turn up mm -hmm. but that was one of those intuitive moments you know yeah. the synchronicities of life why did i listen why did I write to her? Why mm -hmm. did I say, okay, why did I fly to New York a couple of times to meet with her? Uh, why did I say yes to everything she wanted? Because <laughs> you know? I wanted to learn from it. Yeah. So, but that got me going. And once I did it, it's like, well, I did it once. The next time was a little easier and then mm -hmm. a little easier. So now, you know, someone said, can you, can you do this? I know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Maybe not as well as you know, Stephen King or Shakespeare, but I can do something I didn't know or thought I could do before. Yeah, that's beautiful. A great, great story of mixing the, you know, the, the somehow I was going to say spiritual intelligence and positivity. Yeah. 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 Um, and um, so do you want to give us an overview of, because I know there's the book, but there, there is the scorecard, there is the, uh, the course, the yeah. So, yeah, the workbook, so that we have a clear picture of everything that you've created here around uh, positivity. Sure. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What I've done, because I had my own issues of how do I achieve my goals, I take my research background, what I've learned from therapists, 
uh, what I've learned from 2,500 years of history. And I try to consolidate into something that's simple and practical and answers some questions. What does it work? What do I do next? So I've written a book on positive intelligence because that is the evolutionary path of understanding yourself. But, you know, reading a book is not enough. You need, you know, you can't just go back and look at page 12. So I created a workbook that has mm -hmm. exercises, you know, from the book that gets you, gets you engaged in the process. This is a key critical, critical learning skill. How do you get people engaged in learning a skill mm -hmm. or, a, or a creative effort? You have to practice it. Mm -hmm. So the workbook, you know, helps you put down in writing uh, a lot of the information we're talking about. But the key is, uh, you know, like I say, if you, you can't change what you can't measure. So mm -hmm. for me, and I think for a lot of people who give up too soon, uh, if I want to know if my thinking about what I'm doing uh, is aligned with my goals. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a $1 trillion global health and wellness industry. And depending upon the study, 70, 80% of the people don't achieve their goals or they quit the program without achieving their goals. Why? Because they're not making enough progress. They have expectations and they say to themselves every day, I really want to do this, but I'm not making progress. It's never going to happen. So um, you, you have to believe in what you're doing in alignment with what you're doing. And it's like a tale of two scales, I call it. Mm -hmm. Imagine a scale that you're getting onto weigh yourself and imagine a scale where you're rating yourself. And it's kind of like Wayne Dyer said, until you believe it, you won't see it. Uh, so you have to believe in your goals sufficiently to overcome the inevitable you know, anxiety, disappointments. So when you take all three of my things together, read the book, it's fine, it lays it out, go through the workbook mm -hmm. exercises. But to me, what I use you know, regularly, I don't do it very often anymore, is I fill out my scorecard that said, how am I feeling today about what I'm doing? And if I have a goal of 68%, mm -hmm. then I let me reach that. Mm -hmm. That in itself is a victory. If I could change my self-talk to be consistently 68%, I can do anything. So that's what I choose to believe. Yeah. That uh, if I can, again, you know, if I go back, you know, when I realized I was at 20, 30% yeah. positivity, that seemed like a huge leap to go from 20 to 68, mm -hmm. but it goes fairly quick because I I didn't know what I was reaching for. Mm -hmm. But once I realized it, what do I have to do to go from, I'm working on it, but I'm making any progress to, gee, I'm making progress. You know what I had to do? What every writer recommends, you never feel like writing. You sit down and start the writing, then you'll feel like it. So I was waiting for the muse, for the inspiration. You know, this is old advice. Yeah. So once I realized I could raise my attitude to be more confident, more motivated, more disciplined, which are not, which are by definition are positive attitudes, but they don't say positive. Adaptability is a positive trait. It means you're resilient. So it's all these things. I had to be resilient, not just positive. When uh, something happened, okay, I'll come back and I'll fix it. I'll change it. Mm -hmm. When Amazon said, we can't publish your book because, you know, your account is closed. Oh, my God. You know, well, I had to find out what was wrong. So it's it's, it's all those things. That's why I say there were 36 lessons I had to learn uh, yeah. at different points. It's not just a positive thought. That's a little piece of the. It's the collective combined uh, intermittent use of all these traits that we all have, but we don't know how to make them work together unless, I, in my case, is it working and I needed a number to know if it was working. Mm -hmm. So that's what the three parts give you. You know, this is not a thousand dollar program. You know, I've, I've looked at those and, you know, that's that's a different animal. It's like I'm 79 years old. You know, <laughs> you know I, I've done it. It works. Yeah. I'd like other people to benefit from it. Yeah. So that's where I am today. OK. And so. Um... Uh, the name the name of the book is Positivity Intelligence, and I'll Discovery have all of the links written down, you know, so for people right. to see. And uh, and uh, the name of the course then with the thirty six lessons is well, dis Discover Your Positivity Intelligence. Discover Your Positivity Intelligence. Right. Awesome. And so when people get the course, then they get access to the scorecard, and they can fill that up every day as often as they as they need. Right. Correct. 
Okay, right. perfect. Okay, you so buy the books online yeah. or you buy it from the website. Yeah. Uh, but I send you the positivity scorecard because yeah. that's a you know a, a, an Excel or Google Sheets file working on the app now. Yeah. And that I have to sell directly. Okay. And so what would you recommend to people to start with just re reading the book and then move on to the course to apply basically what they learn with the book, right? I, I'm assuming. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. read it once, fill out the scorecard every week. <laughs> oh, yes. But, okay. but the work the workbook helps, you know, get you into the mood, uh, get yeah. you into the rhythm of doing these things to build a habit. And uh and the scorecard is, you know, you fill it in, you don't like your numbers, you can delete them and reuse it. It's not uh, irrevocable. Yeah. So like, you know, on those days, let's say you fill up your scorecard and like your, you know, you don't feel that, uh, you know, into you don't really feel like doing what you're what you aim to be doing. And you realize you're you're only at 20 percent or 30 percent. What happens? And it's like, are there some wasted days? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, one of the things I talk about and I've learned from others is that maybe you have the wrong goal. You know, uh -huh. I thought I wanted to do this. Yeah. Uh, this is one of the, you know, the popular themes is that, you know, I wanted to take up a sport or learn a creative skill. And I just find out it's not what I expected. Mm -hmm. But if you go through the exercises, it asks you these questions mm -hmm. that like, yeah, it seemed like a great idea at the time, but, you know. And I have um, um, a section in there that said, well, if you try something, uh, write it down. And if it doesn't work, come back and try it again. But if after three attempts at something, you really have to reassess yeah. what you're doing. Just because we think it doesn't mean it's the right thing for us. But it all comes down to personal honesty. You know, if you tell yourself you can't do something and then you lie to yourself about what you want, Okay, well, there's some people who are never going to achieve it, but yeah. it gets back to that normal distribution. You know, most people can fit in the middle successfully. There's some people who are wildly successful in everything they do, and there's going to be people at the end where nothing is going to work. Mm -hmm. That's just sure. that's just the way it is. Yeah. But yeah. for the people in the middle, can you move them a bit to the right to have yeah. a greater probability of success than they would have had without being able to measure their positivity IQ. Yeah. Yeah. So on this note, is there like, you know, is there an, an aspect of positivity that we haven't discussed that, you know, that you feel we need to talk about right now? Uh, I think we've been pretty, you know, pretty thorough. You've asked the, you know, the questions it's uh, yeah. but recognizing just to emphasize, to be positive, to be more positive, mm -hmm. does not mean you have to be 100% positive 100% mm -hmm. of the time. Like you mm -hmm. use the word, there's a threshold, yeah. as there is in everything in the universe, mm -hmm. of uh, what you need to uh, achieve something, mm -hmm. you know. And as far as we know now, the level of positivity, optimism that we need to be successful has been unknown and unmeasured. It's only been observed. Mm -hmm. We can see people, Michael Jordan in basketball can tell you, yeah. I'm successful because I practice more than anybody else. Well, we only know what that means to him. Mm -hmm. um, what does it mean for you? So recognize you have to define your own positivity IQ, yeah. but you need some feedback. Michael Jordan knows he was successful because he made more baskets. You know, so in other fields, mm -hmm. I made more baskets, yeah. I made more money, I lost more weight, yeah. uh, I ran faster, I have a larger business. So in every other field, mm -hmm. there's something measurable to identify success. But we haven't had that in the way we think. Mm -hmm. How do I know my that my thinking is more successful? It's observable. Yeah. And some people achieve success, but I don't know what's going on in their mind. Mm -hmm. But as I talk to people, it's like, oh, yeah, you, someone will say, I knew I would do it if I just worked hard enough. Well, how do I emulate that? And mm -hmm. for a lot of us, we need a uh, support. Mm -hmm. And the PIQ approach is to give you that mechanism to help build that support and positivity. So yeah. it's a means to an end. Okay. But meditation, mindfulness, journaling, visualization, uh, affirmations, these are all tools, but by themselves, 
they are mechanisms to help you build a positivity habit, but mm -hmm. you still don't know if it's working until you measure it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you mentioned PIQ. Do you want to tell us about PIQ? Positivity IQ. Oh yeah, positivity. That's IQ. just my shorthand. Okay, and yeah. that's what and that's what uh, that's the percentage that we measure with the scorecard. Correct. We can we name it the PIQ. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Um, she said just one fleeting question that's disappearing in my mind right now, but something you said earlier. I'm not sure if that one's gonna come back. Oh, I hate it when you know I I grab some and then yeah. you know that fleeting moment. Um uh so I think so, like you know, we've talked about the you know, all the course and the book and everything, but now in a more general way, so now that we're getting to the end, is there anything that I haven't asked you, positivity related or otherwise, that you'd yeah. want to you know, to leave our audience with? Uh, no, I think, you know, we, we've covered it. I mean, the other thing I've done in the book is when people say, well, why should I believe you? you okay. Know, mm -hmm. uh, well, I did it. I said I had this goal and I did it. But I recognize that. Okay, I have a 50-year research career. I can say I've applied that. But in each of the chapters in the book, each of the 36 lessons, I try to answer the question, why believe me? Well, mm -hmm. don't believe me. I start out each chapter with what I call the history of wisdom. Mm -hmm. What the, what have philosophers, teachers, scientists, psychologists say over 2,000 years about patience, resilience, adaptability? What have people been saying for centuries that we all know, you know, Monty Python, you know, mm -hmm. had a song, you know, you know, always walk on the sunny side of the street. Yeah. You know, Monty Python knew a positive attitude. Uh, there's look at our songs. There's a, an old Bing Crosby song, you know, accentuate the positive, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. You know, if a songwriter can mm -hmm. observe that happier people are optimistic people, you yeah. can look at countless medical studies that say people with an optimistic, positive attitude live healthier, longer lives with less depression, anxiety. The science is there where they have measured outcomes with something they can't measure. They've observed optimism, positivity, the people who are consistently optimistic and positive, mm -hmm. not a hundred percent have measurable, better outcomes in life. Mm -hmm. yeah. So my goal is if we know that this state of, of the psyche of being positive and optimistic leads to beneficial outcomes. Mm -hmm. If you're having trouble reaching that state, here's a tool mm -hmm. that may help you understand and measure your level of positive thinking so you can enjoy those physiological and psychological benefits too. Yes. Yeah, because yeah, it's not just about goals. It's also, it can be about health and, and general well-being. And, exactly. And yes, just being and feeling happier. And so, I, and I've actually, before we finish it, just one more question. Did you get, do you, do you get comments from your wife or other, you know, people in your entourage when you started researching positivity where, did, did you get comments about, oh, you've changed or your, you know, like, what are you doing that, you know, what are, what are you doing that, uh, <laughs> you know, that's a, that, that's a good change. Well, I get comments, but more of the nature of, if you're so positive, how come you're you're acting that way? <laughs> it's like now they expect me to be more positive more of the time. It's <laughs> okay. like it's like this all or nothing. No, yeah. I'm still going to be a curmudgeon sometimes. Okay. But uh, but <laughs> but for now, they can recognize when I'm not so positive. Okay. Instead of saying, "Why don't you be more positive?" It's like, you know, why are you not being positive? <laughs> so <laughs> you're right. It's observed. It's like. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but you, you've created some uh, some uh, very high standard for yourself, right? A higher standard, conspicuous <laughs> yeah. by its absence now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. uh, well, that was super interesting, uh, uh, Richard. So, uh, and it sounds like you have a, you know a lot about philosophy as well. So maybe that could be for you know if you're interested, maybe another conversation about teaching us stuff around 
philosophy as well. That sounds interesting. I'd be very interested. One of my books I've put aside is on synchronicity. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in that, as Carl Jung first defined it, uh, another fascinating semi-spiritual concept because mm -hmm. things happen and we don't know why, but I think there is a reason why they happen. Yeah. So. Okay. But yeah, and I think like you and me talking right now is uh, the result of a synchronicity, right? Exactly. Yeah. Why I sat in that day, we had a chance to talk and yeah, I said something that interested you. So this was meant to be. Exactly. <laughs> yes, I love it. But thank you so much, Richard, for spending this time with us. And um, and I shall I shall see you soon in another of our you know monday, our meditations right? yeah monday exactly, sure. the monday uh, meditation and um and so thank you thank you very much and thank you to everyone who's been uh, who is listening uh, to us up until the end and i shall see you all uh, next week well not next week but soon <laughs> <laughs> for another career and spirituality conversations bye, thank everybody. you very much for having me it's been a pleasure talking with you thank you richard bye bye